Good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. We'll gripe and grumble and complain about it. You know, I mean, we've heard that before, right? And how many know this is a day we're going to rejoice and be glad in it? In spite of the rain, the cold, and all the deer hunters are happy. Hallelujah. I'm not a hunter, so I don't get excited about this season. I like to fish, but I think hunting is close to murder. But anyway, we'll leave that alone and because uh, I know there's a lot of deer hunters out there. I said that one time when I was over in the hill country, and they said the first time you hit a deer with your car and it totals your car, you'll become a murderer too. So I said, okay, well, we'll just better hang on to that, you know. And then, so it's a, it is an honor to be with you this morning. It's good to see the leadership team and, and Bishop Ron. And we go, like he said, we go way back. We've made some ministry trips. God's had us in, in some unusual places. Uh, one time we were in the home of a judge down in uh, Puebla, Mexico. And she'd been raised in a spirit-filled Pentecostal home and and she was starting to get turned on to Jesus. And so while we're standing there ministering to her, she begins to manifest demonic activity. So I look at Bishop and I said, this must be your realm. It's not mine, all right? You know, and, uh, but she went through deliverance that day, didn't she? Yeah, powerful deliverance. And of course, Bishop and Brother John, we went down to Venezuela together a couple years ago. And they're still gleaning from the impact and the importation that took place during that time, and, and I'm telling you, it's a country that is on the verge of probably civil war, and uh, if they don't hang on to the principles of God, uh, it could really do a lot of damage, and so we're believing the God to continue to raise up the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in Venezuela and see some powerful things happening in that country. Um, God's moving all over the world. I told the group yesterday, the fastest growing religious group in the world is Christianity. And uh, we're just going to smoke them out. You know, people ask me, so what do you think about what's going on in the Middle East? I said, it's an answer to prayer. Answer to prayer? How do you mean? I said, well, I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so all we see is governments clashing. The government of darkness and the government of light, they're clashing. And uh, guess what? Who wins in the end? If I read Revelation right, there's no need for sun, moon, or stars because God is the light. You got that? And so that's exciting to me. And so we see that happening. I was in the country of uh, the United Arab Emirates this year. Uh, There's some things that God's wanting to do in that nation. I didn't realize what a Corinthian point it was. Uh, Dubai is uh, probably 90% foreigners, and uh, they come from all over the world to work in Dubai. And uh, I was really encouraged by what I saw happening there. A uh, pastor went over about five years ago. God told him to go to Dubai, start a work. He started with 40 people, and now he's running four services, anywhere between 500 and 1,000 in each one of those services. And so there's a hunger going on. There's one group that meets. uh, They are Tamil Indians. There's about 2,500 of them that meet on Sunday morning in a hotel ballroom. They worship God. They sing unto the Lord. They have the word. And then their whole objective is to go back out and evangelize those that they're working with. And so it's God has got some unique strategies that he's downloading at this particular time. And one of the things that I see happening in this country is we are victims of our own success because we think if it worked 20 years ago, it's got to work today. And my prayer has been, God, give us new strategies in this culture to so we can free, begin to confront this postmodern culture that we're living in. How do we do that? And the challenge is very great because we're living in a time when if they, if they haven't seen it in the natural, they can find it on the Internet. Isn't that right? You know, so, so Googling goes on, you know. Uh, uh, you know, I tell people, I said, we don't need revelation anymore. We just need Google. Okay, moving right along, all right. You know, but that's, that's the world we're living in today. And so I, I'm thankful for Google. I just know that he's not seated at the right hand of the Father. <laughs> okay, all right, you know. But uh, it's really good to be here. I, I wanted to share some thoughts with you this morning. 
about some things that I'm seeing happen across the body of Christ. Uh, Pastor talked to, our bishop talked about the post-Christian era that we're living in. And I believe that we are coming into a time, and I shared this last time I was here, that we are now in transition into a new era. Uh, we are moving from evangelicalism into the era of apostleship. And where we are right now and why it looks so ugly for Christianity is because we're in the plowing stage. And how many of you know plowing is not, you don't take your friends out to see something you just plowed. Isn't that right? You know, but we're in this stage. And so we're in this time where God is plowing and laying all the underground force that he can put down a solid foundation for where he has taken the body of Christ. And so to me, that's very encouraging. To me, that's very uplifting. And so what has happened is that when that begins, you know, the Bible says that we're to not to despise the day of small beginnings. And a lot of times, if you'll see, go back through church history, you will see that there was not a lot of people that got on the bandwagon right away. And God had to slowly transition us out of the last thing that era that he was doing things into the new era of what he's doing today and uh, so we're seeing that begin to happen and uh, and so I'm encouraged by that but one of the things that I see and that's what I want to speak to you about this morning is my question is are you staying at your post you know are you are you in that place where God has because I'm convinced it's not so much the person of Christ it's the position that Christ places us in that we struggle with and we have warfare with and we battle with and we wrestle with on an ongoing basis. Uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles or whatever you got electronically or written page or, you know, whatever. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, I heard an interesting story the other day. An old couple was laying in bed, you know, now that I'm getting up to be 65. Um, that's not old to me. You know, 65 is the new 30. All right. You know, if you're 100, okay, you're close to 50, all right? Okay, so anyway, you get the idea. And so, so you know, he's laying in bed, and, and, and uh, the husband leaned over to his wife and says, you know, we've been tried, tested, and true. And she looked back and said to him, yeah, well, I'm sick and tired of you too. And so that's kind of what we're getting to that place where we're kind of sick and tired of just the old status quo. We're sick and tired. We want some things to begin to happen. Why? Because even though we're not liberals, we're still progressive. <laughs> I got to be careful using that word nowadays, you know, because we know there's a certain a segment of our culture that that's the term they use. They are the progressives. But how many of you know the king, maybe we ought to be the advancers. That's a better term. Let's do use that one, all right? We are advancing the purposes of God. We're advancing the kingdom of God in this age. And so whenever there is that confrontation in governmental realm, you're going to see these continual clashes that go on. And number one, how many of you know the natural man doesn't understand the things of the spirit? Now, if you want a description of the natural man, go to Romans chapter 1. That will give you a great example of that. They worship the creature instead of the creator, that whole concept. You know, so, so the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. So you go out and you try to explain to somebody, they're looking at you like a calf looking at a new gate. They have no idea what you're talking about. And so we've got to break it down into cultural language that can begin to penetrate into their mindset that would free them up to at least begin to consider. Why? Because you will not change somebody's belief system until you change their way of thinking. You got that? All right, and so why? Because our churches are full, and most of what our preaching is today is we're, we have great places that are filled to capacity with pe preachers that are preaching things that people already believe. One of the great disjustices that's going on in the body of Christ is there's no longer any thought challenge to the body of Christ to change their way of thinking. And so what happens is, why? Because we become cultural sensitive that I cannot make them think any different because if not, then they won't depend on me. Well, listen, the last I checked, they weren't to depend on me anyway. I was just going to be a guider, a voice that's there. And so we begin to see some things, 
and these cycles that we go through. Now, let me look at this with you, if you would, because we live in a time of great tension. I'm not talking about your marriage or your bank account, even though that's part of it. But, but I want you to think this with me, okay, because this is life. This is the way it is, that there's tensions that we're constantly coming in contact. There's life, and then there's death. How many know that? You know, you, someday you're going to die. I just thought if that's not a revelation to you, let me be the first one to tell you that. Someday you're not going to be here, all right? Someday you'll graduate. Someday, you know, we go through the, the whole thing. But there's always this tension, you know, that, that I'm doing today what God wants me to do. But you know what? Tomorrow I could be in his presence just, I mean, gone just like that. Uh, this week we had uh, the catastrophe last week. Miles Monroe and his team and his wife, they were flying to, in the Bahamas, they were flying to their leadership forum. He, his plane comes down, hits a crane, they're all killed. Boom, he's gone, just like that. A general in the body of Christ, boom, it's gone. Death is part of that, but we don't talk about that. I'll tell you why we don't talk about it. Because we're people of life, right? So we talk about life. But the reality is, part of that life message is that it does, it, it, somewhere Paul said, I've got to take off this earthen vessel and I've got to step over into a realm that I've been preparing myself forever. You see, so it does, it's not a, something that we, 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 we fear. It's not something Jesus removed all that. It's something that is a reality of life. But we constantly live in that tension between life and death. We live in a tension between joy and sorrow. You know, we, and so we come into our services and man, it's joyful, it's joyful. But what about those that are sitting amongst us that this week and this period of time that we have been overwhelmed with sorrow in our midst? Because there is that realm in life. There's that tension that, you know, what is too much joy and what is too much sorrow? And so we're trying to find the equilibrium that's in there. There's this tension between darkness and light. You know, we go on and on between power and weakness, between lack and abundance. You know, a young person came to me the other day and he said, you know, Brother Terry, I want you to pray for me. I'm going to own a McDonald's. I said, well, that's a, that's a very good achievable goal. I said, do you have faith to own a McDonald's? He said, I have faith, and I'm just waiting on the Lord. I said, well, let me give you a, a, a process. He goes, what's that? I said, go get a job at McDonald's. <laughs> what? A job at McDonald's? What are you talking about? I said, well, that's the seed. That's the beginning process. Until you plant the seed, you can't give God anything to work with. I said, so get, go get a job and work so well that they have to promote you to manager. And when you get promoted to manager, work so well that they say, we need you in the head office. Or better, you know, when they move you to the head office, and I said, you work so well that they say, listen, are you interested in owning McDonald's? See, but we, we want this magical uh, uh, aurora to drop out of the sky somewhere and boom, it's all going to hit us. But there's this tension between until we get to that place, like, like Brother John and, and Barbara were talking about this morning, until we get to that place, we forget that there's a whole process that we've got to work to that God says, now I trust you because I've seen you and I know you and you know me. Now I can do something on your behalf. Hello? Lack and, lack and abundance. It's a tension. There's a tension between power and weakness. You know, how many, how many of you had those days when, man, everything seemed to be going your way? I mean, you felt like, golly, I could take on the devil right now and whip the snot out of him. How many of you ever felt that way? I mean, you feel like you're going down your street on your, uh, where you live, and you're going down the street, and you go, Shundai, and all the garage doors open. I mean, how do you know? That's power, right? But how many of you know there's those times of weakness when you pull in the driveway and you hit the back of the garage because the garage door wasn't open? There's those times of weakness that we have in our life. And it's a tension that's there. And Paul went through this very same thing. He says in Philippians chapter 4, he says, he says I have, not that I speak in regards to need, for I have learned. Key phrase, we miss this part. He said, I have learned. You see, in order to reach this point of how to effectively 
handle tension in our life, there's some things we've got to learn. There's things that don't bother me now that used to bother me all the time. You know, I couldn't stand it for people to be late. When I was young and had a singing group, I, I, there's three ladies that were on our team. They were altos and sopranos and all that good stuff. And, and I said to them, we're traveling from Dallas to El Paso. We got a concert uh, tomorrow night, and we got a concert on Saturday. I said, we're leaving here at such and such time. If you're not here, have a nice weekend. So what happens? Three girls. I wait. And now listen, I'm gracious. I figure if God's gracious, I can be gracious. So I gave him 15 extra minutes. 15 minutes shows up. I said, everybody in the vehicles, let's go. Everybody's quiet. He's like, he's going to leave them. I mean, gonna, we need them on our team and they're going to leave. And what are we going to do now? We get to El Paso, I get a phone call. Now, that was the days when you didn't have cell phones. We didn't even have pagers. Now, some of you may not remember what pagers are, but, but they were reminders for just in case you were senile. All right, but anyway, pager. But I get a phone call. Oh, bro, Terry, we are so sorry. You know, this and this. I said, hey, have a nice weekend. They never were late again. But then God started taking me to the mission field. Now in Latin cultures, when they say 10 o'clock, that means to start getting ready at 10 o'clock. Right? So I learned this a long time ago. There's a key word. If you want to be keep your sanity in the mission field, there's a word that you've got to get a revelation of. And that word is flexible. Flexible. And so I've had to learn some things. And some of us in our life, you know, we walk around this journey. And Paul said, I have learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. That could be Texas, Oklahoma, you know, uh, New York, Florida, you know. I've learned to be content. Content. The word content there is an interesting word because here's what it says. When you know you've learned to be content is when the word says, I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. I've learned to be independent of the circumstances. I know there's things going on around me. I know those things are happening. I'm not ignoring those things. I'm not faithing it out of my life. I'm not confessing it out of my life. But they do not have the effect upon me that it should have. I've learned to be independent of those circumstances. Wow. You see, I've come to believe that there are no successful people. You say, well, what about Bill Gates? We only know how much money he has. We don't know what's happening with he and his wife. We don't know what's happening with he and his children. We don't know what's happening in his health. We don't know those type of things. So, you know, if we look at the whole scope of what success is, so here's what I've come to believe, is that there are no successful people. There are only successful moments, and we need to enjoy it for the time. Why? Why? Because we're always changing. Things are, are, are shifting. Things are happening. Now, in 2 Corinthians, Paul deals with this. What time is this service over? Uh, oh, when I say so? Uh, oh, you're flexible. <laughs> Somebody getting revelation already this morning. Hallelujah. You know. Okay, I promise I won't keep you past midnight. And by the way, Paul preached at midnight. The guy fell out and died. Paul went down and raised him from the dead. If you fall out and die, I've never raised anybody from the dead. You got a 50-50 chance. That's all I can tell you. You know. But Paul says, he's writing to the church at Corinth. This is his second letter. In chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Wow. In other words, Paul's saying, you better 
recognize what I'm doing. You better recognize who I am. You better recognize. Paul's struggling with some things here. He's in that tension mode, see, because he's poured in and poured in, poured in and poured in. And the struggle that he had was the fact that they never received Paul as a spiritual father. They only received him as a spiritual teacher. And there's a whole big difference between a spiritual father and a spiritual teacher. And he goes on and he says, For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you. In the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, and on the right hand and on the left. Man, it sounds like he's really qualified. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrow, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, and as having nothing, yet possess, possessing all things. Now let me read it to you out of the Message Bible. The Message Bible says it this way, Companions, we are in this work with you. We beg you, please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us. Man, how many of us are squandering things that God's given us? You know, that's the whole job of the world system is to get us distracted and get us off course. God reminds us, I've heard you call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Well, now is the right time to listen. The day to be helped. Don't put it off. Don't frustrate God's work by showing up late. That's definitely not in Spanish, I'll guarantee you, you know. Throwing a question mark over everything we're doing. Our work as God's servants gets validated or not in the details. People are watching us as we stay at our post alertly and unswervingly. And he goes on and he says, in hard times, tough times, bad times, when we're beaten up, when we're jailed, when we're mobbed, working hard, working late, working without eating. Sounds like your schedule. Huh? With a, with a pure heart, clear head, stand, steady hand, in gentleness, holiness, honest love. When we're telling the truth, when God's showing his power, when we're doing our best setting things right, when we're, we're praised and when we're blamed, slandered and honored, true to our word, though distrusted, ignored by the world, but recognized by God, terrifically alive, though rumored to be dead. You ever had that happen? All your friends go, wow, you know, they, they used to be the life of the party. And now they're going, I don't know what happened to him. He got religion. What they're saying is he died somewhere along the way, and I didn't, I didn't even go to the funeral, you know. But anyway, beaten within an inch of our lives but refusing to die. Now, I like that one. That's what's happening with Annie. Man, she'd beaten within an inch of her life, but she refuses to die. Why? Because the assignment isn't over. Immersed in tears. How many have ever had one of those around the altar? You know, when you get up, there's just a lake of cannons, you know, around the altar, you know. Yet always filled with deep joy. See, he's independent of circumstances. Living on handouts, yet enriching many, having nothing, but yet having it all. Wow. Says it pretty good, doesn't it? I want you to think with me just a minute. Paul is describing some things here. And what he's describing are people that weren't as on fire or they weren't running with intensity the race that was set before them. They were still running the race, but they weren't running it as often as good. And he said, listen, this is what happened to us on your behalf. Now, what has happened to you? It's not that you don't love God. It's not that you don't have a relationship with God. It's not that you don't want more of God. But there's something inside of us that all of a sudden things begin to happen and we start putting the brakes on. How many of you got scars that you got in your life? 
you know, you fell over a tree or you ran into a building. I remember one time when I was a kid, we were playing hide-and-go-seek. I came around the corner of a house, and a brick met my nose. My brother had let it go. You know? So you think I got this naturally. No, I didn't. It came by design. But here, all, but I remember I got scars, and I can tell stories about it. All of us have scars, nicks, things that have happened to us, and all those scars, they have a story, don't they? You know, we need to have a conference sometime and call it the St- Telling the Stories of Our Scars Conference and have everybody come and talk about the scars on our bodies. You know, some would be longer than others because some have longer scars. Or some have more scars or little nicks that come along. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, those big boo-boos, you know. I mean, last year at this time, I wasn't able to make it because I was getting a nose job. I had cancer on my nose, and it was so deep, they had literally had to cut out my nose. And so I had to go in and reconstruct it. So when my grandsons come over, first of all, they're shocked. Well, that bothered me because when I looked in the mirror, I wasn't nearly as shocked as they were when they looked at me. And my youngest one, he's four years old, and he goes, Poppy, you got a big boo-boo, and it's right there. I said, well, thank you very much. I said, how did you know that? He said, I can see it. <laughs> you know, and thanks. And so, so we, but we get into these things. You know, we got stitchings on our body, you know, where they put us back together and stitched us all up. And so we do that. And I begin to think in the body of Christ how many internal unseen scars, nicks, and stitches that have hurt us the most that are on the inside that nobody else knows about. Now, you get around those faith people and those mighty people, they don't have any. I say, well, then you're not living. You know, you're not living. What was it that there were 500 in the upper room but only 120 stayed. What caused the other 380 to leave their post? What caused them to, they couldn't even wait around. It wasn't even 40 days. What caused that to happen in their life? And what I see in the body of Christ is that we may be sitting in a facility week after week, but somewhere along the line, there's those unseen scars and nicks and stitches in our life that we've been hurt by, and we've got to understand that it's caused us to slow down and it's caused us not to embrace the post that God's given us. When I was young... I got a letter from Uncle Sam, and it said, congratulations, you have been selected to serve in the military. Now, I didn't even sign up for anything. So why were they selecting me? This wasn't, this wasn't the lottery or anything like that. You know, this, they selected me. I mean, I felt privileged. My government has selected me. So they put me on a bus, and they take me down and ruin my life for the next two years. And they tell me when to get up. They tell me when to go to bed. They tell me what to wear. They tell me what kind of haircut I have to have. I mean, it is horrible. But when I got to Vietnam, I prayed, God, do not put me out there where live bullets are active. Because I am a big target. I remember we were going through Okinawa on our way to Vietnam. And these two guys, they were all dirty and muddy. And that's the way they came back from Vietnam at that time. And they're all standing, and they're standing. As all the newbies are going this way. The ones going home are going this way. And two guys were standing, and they're going, yep, yep, nope, yep, yep. And they looked at me, and they're pointing as I walk by, and they go, no way. I stopped. I said, no way what? They said, we're deciding who's going to go over alive and come back alive and who's going to go over alive and come back dead. And the size of you, you're too big, you're dead. So I'm thinking, great, I'm getting on the next plane headed into Vietnam, and I'm already a dead man walking on that plane. So I'm thinking, God, give me a good job. So the job he gave me was I worked for a full bird colonel, and he had five battalions underneath him, and all I had to do was take care of him. So that meant I got to live in the officer's quarters. 
That meant I had lobster on Wednesday and steak on Friday. That meant I had air conditioning the whole time. But whenever, and Monday was malaria pill day. And malaria pill would hit the colonel about 2 o'clock in the morning. And he'd come knock on my door and he called me Tommy. He said, Tommy, let's go. Where are we going? I don't know. Let's go. So we'd get in the car and he'd head out. Well, where we was is right across, there was a heliport. And on one side was General Abrams, who was the MACV commander at that time. And on the other side was our four helicopters. And the, there was a guard that sat right at General Abrams' helicopters. That's all he had to do was watch the, his helicopters, not even ours. So we're pulling through the gate. I'm blinking my lights. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, I've got to help this guy out. Let him know somebody's coming. You know, there's a live body coming. The colonel, we stop right by the post. The colonel gets out of the car, goes over, gets the man's helmet, weapon belt, and his rifle and puts it in the car. And he said, now, Tommy, wait here. And he went and got the uh, officer in charge. And the guy wakes up. He goes, man, why didn't you warn me? I said, I did. I was blinking my lights. I couldn't honk the horn because I'd have woke the colonel up then. You know? He said, man, I am in big trouble. And I said, that's absolutely right. You see, what I'm trying to get across is the church is at its post, but it's asleep. And there's an inspection coming, an inspection time. And what I've seen that's causing us to go to sleep is these undealt with, there's a difference. Let me give you just some things. First of all, number one, there's a difference between a hurt and a wound. Proverbs 18, 14. It says, the Amplified says, strong, the strong spirit of man sustains him in pain or trouble. But a weak or broken spirit, who can raise up or bear? You see, the Apostle Paul was involved here because he was having to forgive these Corinthians. See, he had a need in his own life. He's not this big superhero that everybody makes him out to be. There was a lot of blunders in Paul's life. And, and that even though he did some great things and gave us the uh, two-thirds of the New Testament, we need to understand that he also had elements in his life that caused him to slow down. And he couldn't go at this rapid thing. And he had feelings mixed in there too because he's describing to the Corinthians, guys, this is what's happening. And I want you to know I'm going to forgive you but listen, here's what I'm picking up, Corinthians. You really don't appreciate what I've done for you. That, my friend, is a big hurt. When you have done and you've done and you've done and you've done, and the end, they kick you in the teeth. How many know I'm talking about? How many See, that's a scar in all of us. That is a scar, see. And so what happens then is we begin to understand that, that really, well, because they didn't appreciate what skull, skull, Paul Skull, Skull of Paul Sala. I'll get it here in a minute, all right? If you want to know what that is, it's Malaysian. <laughs> all right, you know. But Paul kept reminding them of the ministry, but it didn't slow, it didn't stop him from getting out of his post, but he did have an effect upon him while he was in his post. You see, a hurt is an external thing. That's why, as an act of our will, we forgive. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? Because a wounded spirit is, a, is an internal thing, and that takes a process of restoration. You just don't get over that. And what the enemy does while you're in restoration, something will happen, and what the enemy will say to you is, I thought you forgave them. Ever heard that before? I thought you forgave them. And what you need to tell the enemy is, I did. I'm still in process. Because you're getting a wounded spirit out of your, your life. You keep, uh, And what it means is that you keep on forgiving. You keep walking in forgiveness towards them. It's not that you don't, you're not truthful to them. It's not that you don't do those type of things. But here's what I see the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, we are so wounded that we would rather lie to one another than to speak the truth. See? So a wound and a hurt, we've got to understand the difference. And where does this affect us? Let me give you some things here. Because here's what I begin to see. And it came to me 
the difference between the conscious and the subconscious. Now, I'm not getting psyche on you, because Paul talked about the conscience. The subconscious, he talks about the inner man. But I'm just going to put it in terms that we understand today. But here's what I begin to see, that I was sitting in a meeting in uh, Florida, and I was doing a conference with a guy named Mark Sharona, and several other prophets and apostles were there. And one of the things that this young man got up, his father's a bishop, he's a black guy, he was a bishop of a, of a group, and this young man was pastoring, but he was also a businessman. And he does what's called the businessman's round table. And he said, I sit down with these businessmen, and we go over principles, and we go over things like this, and he said, they'll get up and do just the opposite. And he said, I couldn't understand. He made one statement. He said, somewhere there's a detachment or a blockage between the conscience of knowing what to do and the subconscious of not being able to do it. Hmm. The conscience. The conscience. It's knowing what to do in the mind not being able to do it. I've come to believe that the conscience is somewhere the linkage between the soul man and the body. It's somewhere in that process. Paul says, he talks about in Acts 24, he says, I have a conscience that's without offense towards God and man. If you really want to know, and if you're into end time teachings, one of the major end times teaching concepts you'll find is that offense is the number one thing that Jesus talks about. How many have ever been offended? How many have ever been offended? We all have been offended, right? If we haven't been offended, we're getting ready to be offended. You got something to look forward to. You see. And Paul goes on and he talks about that and it begins to bring in this hurt and this whole ideal that's here. You see, when, when in the conscience, it's like, and when the, when the subconscious is blocked, we're able, to, we're able to, what's the word I want? Profess one thing, but we practice something else. And this is rampant in the church world. This is rampant internationally. They're saying one thing, but they're doing something totally different. And we're seeing it again and again. The subconscious, when it's blocked, it represents the spiritual scar tissue scars my wife she didn't have our boys naturally she had them through procedure it's called a c-section i don't know why they call it c-section just a good name i guess i, I don't know c-section i guess when they get through cutting on you it looks like a c i don't know i know it stands for cesarean so don't all you nurses come running up afterwards and say well let me explain that to you all right but the idea is that over a period of time, not when she had the children, but later on in life, the scar tissue from that began to affect her. And she had to go back in and have that scar tissue removed. Now, here's the other thing. They could not guarantee that it wouldn't return. And then the subconscious, when the subconscious is blocked, that inner man is blocked. It's this spiritual scar tissue in our life. That we can, the good thing about it, when God heals, he does it all the way. You see, he doesn't leave scar tissue and the possibility of it coming back again. And God's not into relief, God's into release. And when we begin to see this, we begin, and what I begin to see is that the subconscious area is the place of our habits. It's the place of our customs. It's the place of our traditions. You see, you see, I like what one man says, is we don't decide our future, our habits decide our future. And the habits is where we're, what gets, keeps us uh, doing certain things. Now, when I explain that, I tell people, you know, it's like when we, I have a routine. How I many you know we got these routines in our life? I have this routine. I get up, my wife says, we need some milk. So I get up, get in my vehicle, and I go to Walmart, pick up the milk, come back home. I can do that without even thinking. I mean, my car just basically knows where to go. I just get in and kind of steer. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. We don't even think about that. Why? Because it's in my subconscious that that's what I'm going to do. But on the way, she says, oh, by the way, stop by the cleaners and pick up the clothes. 
Now that's outside of my routine. So guess what I do? I get in the vehicle. The vehicle goes right by the cleaners. And I get all the way, pick up the milk, come right back to the house. And my wife says, where are the clothes? Uh, they're at the cleaners. Why didn't you get them? Didn't it, what, what's our wording? Didn't even think about it. Now all of us have done that. You see? And so what happens to us is that when we want to change or we've gone through cer certain things or certain things have happened in our life, because it's not part of our habit or our routine or our tradition or our custom, we embrace it, we can get it, we can say it, but we can't practice it. Because sometimes it's the wound in our life. You see, Paul said in 1 Timothy, he says, because of the hypocrisy, you've had your conscience seared. Cauterized is the word. You see, it's the, it, when, we, when we have our hearts, our minds, our conscience cauterized, it's because our belief and our behavior, it's lined up in such a way, whether it's God or not, we do it. Are you all all right this morning? Now look at here. Okay, I'm going to hurry, all right? Because in this, we have the sound of God, but we don't have the motivation or the initiative of God. So what happens when we ha our subconscious, our inner man is blocked, guess what it does? It either opens our spirit or it closes our spirit. How do we know if we got a closed spirit? Very easily. A closed spirit is the filter of all of our defenses, our suspicions, and our skepticisms. How many of you have ever met a skeptical person? How many of you have ever shared with somebody and they kind of look at you like, yeah, really, what, what do you really want? One time we did this mission outreach down to Mexico. God told us to go down and minister to the people. We were to pay for their meals, pay for their hotel. So we invited, uh, I'm working with a missionary, and he invited about 10 couples. We came together, and, and there was a couple that came. Out, the guy was out of San Antonio. And his name was Peter. So he knocks on my hotel door, and he comes and knocks on the door, and he goes, hello. I said, hi, how you doing? He said, um, are you Terry Thompson? I said, yeah. And he said, uh, well, we're here. I said, for what? He said, well, uh, the missionary told us that we were to come here and you were going to pay for our room and pay for our meals. And I said, who told you that? Now his eyes are getting big. He goes, well, the missionary. I said, well, you know what? He is absolutely right. And here's what he said to me. What do you all want? And I said, nothing. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, but what do you really want? And I said, nothing. He goes, you mean to tell me you're going to pay for the room and you're going to give me a meal you're going to minister to us? I said, that sounds pretty right to me. He goes, yeah, but really you want something, don't you? And I said, I'll tell you what I want. I want to be obedient to the Lord and what he told us to do. I said, I want nothing from you. God told us to do this for you. Here's what he said. I've never heard of that. Man was loaded with suspicion, skepticism. You see, we have these defenses. God's trying to get us new revelation. God's trying to download us where he's going, what he's doing. But the body of Christ is so full because they have been deceived. They've been duped. They've been uh, badgered. They've been lied to in so many ways. Not everybody, but you, we know there's that, those elements that are out there that we have created this blockage. And then when God starts downloading what he's trying to do in this present truth, they do not have the capacity to embrace it. And so we have these closed 
spirits all over the world. In leaders, in congregants, in the body of Christ, and God's saying, I'm trying to do something new. I'm trying to advance something for my kingdom. But I've got to do something in them before I can do something through them. So God starts downloading this to me. And I said, okay, God, then how do we get by beyond this? I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 2, and I'm almost finished. You know what that means when a preacher says that? Nothing, absolutely nothing. It just makes him feel good. You see, the church has provided a refuge for the fugitives from God. But if we're going to open our spirits again, open, let the Spirit of God flow into us, flow out of us, flow through us, however you want to describe that, we've got to realize there's some things God's got to do. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, Peter had preached his powerful message. How many of you know Peter Peter preached YouTube messages? Took him about five minutes, and I bet you it would have been on YouTube. What do you bet? But in the end, he says, or the, the people respond to him in verse 37, and here's what they say. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, or the King James says they were pricked in their hearts. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I like that word pricked in the heart. The New American Standard in the footnote says this. They were smitten in their conscience. They were smitten in their conscience. One of the names of God is he's a smiter. Ezekiel talks about that, and there's one other place. I can't remember what it is now. We need God, in order for the body of Christ to get their spirit open again, we need a healing going on of these wounded spirits, and the only way it's going to happen is God's got to come and smite us. Not destroy us, just smite us. They were smitten in their conscience. Then what it did, it created the question that they realized their condition. They said, how can we be saved from this perverted religion system that we're in? Now, that's paraphrasing it. It takes, see, in other words, it takes somebody being smitten in their conscience to realize they're not in the right system. And they ask the question, what shall we do? And you all know the story. Peter says, repent, be baptized, etc." How do we know that our spirit is open? I think it gives us some clue, clues here, and I won't take time to expound on every one of them, but I'll just highlight them and let, you, let the Holy Spirit speak to you and see if this, this activity is going on in your life. Look at verse 43. Actually, let's go back to verse 42. And they continued consistently, steadfastly, Today we have such a floundering, smorgasbord, Luby's concept of Christianity that there's no continuity. I love what Bishop said today about longevity of relationships. You see, it's not how many places you can go, it's the one place you can be planted in that will produce the fruit in your life. But we have this going through the body of Christ. Who's got the hottest thing right now? Who's got the greatest style going on right now? Who has the greatest music? If none of that changes your life, you're just attending an event. So we must, and not only that, it will draw you out of your post. It says they continued consistently, steadfastly. Look what they continued in. The apostles' doctrine. I wrote the word government there. 
first thing God does is he checks out government. Apostles' doctrine. I know there's a whole another ramification goes with that. But for me, that represents governments. Second thing he says is fellowship. Am I building relationships? Am I building relationships? If I am, then chances are my spirit is open. And the third thing was breaking of bread. Am I in a, in a place where I'm going to common ground with where God has posted me? If not, then God, if you posted me here, help me figure out what that common ground is. Because I want to say this to you. If there's no common ground, there is no communication. If there's no communication, there's no communion. And Then the last one, he says prayer. Prayer to me represents revelation. Revelation. Revelation coming. Look what else he says. And then fear came upon every soul. Sign, another sign is the fear of the Lord. It's, it, my spirit is open now because I'm walking in the fear of the Lord. That's a whole other area. He goes on and he says, he says, now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now, I've already addressed that. They sold their possessions and gave them to Terry Thompson and divided them among Terry Thompson's ministry as anyone had need. And Terry Thompson has a need. Okay, so it's... You maybe have a different version. But look at this one. Verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Here's that breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. And verse 47 concludes it. Praising God. An open spirit wants to praise God. Because they know an open spirit knows that it will eventually lead to worship. And worship will lead to the glory. Praising God. Notice what else it says. And having favor with all the people. I was glad to hear Brother John's testimony today. That's favor. That's where the church has got to get back to. We're having favor in the community. We're having favor in the region. We're having favor at the job. We're having favor at the school. We're having favor at Dairy Queen. We're having favor at Wendy's. We're having favor at the Mexican restaurant. Okay, maybe you don't get that, all right? But as you can tell, I've had a whole lot of favor. All right. Favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You see, we got to allow God to do the laser surgery. We got to allow Him to come in. We got to allow Him to go deeper, whatever's blocking us. Some of you know this is the right thing to do. Some of you know you're saying all the right things, but somehow you haven't linked together what you're saying and what you're doing. And as a result, God can't bless that. Because the double-minded man is unstable in all their ways. And look at this. For those that have that blockage, what was good before, now is just okay. You're not reaching for the optimum. You're not going for the maximum. You're not going for the, the excellence that, that was there. You're not going for that anymore. You just kind of slowed down in the race. Some people are not whole. And they keep lying to themselves. I'm okay. I'm all right. How you doing? What do we say? Fine, 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 fine. Like going pile. Golly. You know, I'm fine. The most deceptive time in the body of Christ is Sunday morning. Because when we walk through those doors, everybody say, how you doing? We go, fine, 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 fine. And then as soon as Bishop gets up here, makes an altar call, we all come running to the altar. Okay. Instead of a community of healing and transparency, now it's a place of cover-up, condemnation, 
and destruction. And the spiritual laws of power are thrown out. We start unplugging. We start toning down the generator. We start excusing the absence of the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing that gets me. We reveal our desperation for the presence of God instead of walking in the presence of God. You see, I hear this a lot. Lord, we need you. Well, I needed him and I still need him. I need him every day. I need him every minute. What has happened? Close our spirits. There's been so much wounding that's gone on. We've declared things and they haven't happened. So people even question the reality and the truth of true prophecy. So where are we? I want you to stand with me, please. Oh, Jeff, if you would, come to the keyboard. I want you to do something this morning. This is what God showed me. This morning, there's a cloud over our lives. I didn't say it was a bad cloud. didn't say it was a good cloud. I just saw a cloud. But cloud sometimes represents to me two things. Judgment, number one, on those who don't believe. And number two, deliverance to those that respond. We sang about the Shekinah glory of God, which we're going to sing again. We sing about it. But the Lord spoke this to me this morning when I was praying about this service. And the Lord says, I want them to do a prophetic act. Okay, God, they believe in that. I'm pretty sure. I know Bishop. They've had prophets in. Prophets do weirder things than apostles. Would you agree? You know? I mean, look at Agabus. He put a girdle on an apostle. I've never done that for my wife, you know. But anyway, I don't even know if they have them anymore, you know. But the reality is, prophets do unusual things. But from time to time, us apostles get to do that too. So don't worry. Don't be freaking out. But it's simply this. God says, tell them, when they clap their hands, the heavens will open. It's like something is breaking in the spirit realm. Now, if I was Jewish, I'd be in here with a shofar, you know. I'm not so certain the significance of the shofar other than what it taught us what Israel did. There's another trumpet we need to hear. John said it was like the voice of God. So I'm going to ask, Dave, I want you to come stand up here, Brother Tim. Bishop, would you stand right there? I want you to face the congregation. And on the count of three, they're going to lead us. It starts at the head, goes down to the bottom. They're going to lead us. Now, I don't know how many times we're going to do this. We're going to do it once, I know. We're going to, we're going to break some things and open up some things. And more than this, when we walk out of here, it's no longer... God, we want more, but God, I'm, I'm receiving more. I'm getting more. My spirit is unplugged. My conscience is open. I'm, I'm ready to, to move beyond that place. And you're going to watch God begin to lead you down a path that the end result today is not a day where all the wholeness is going to take place. It's only the start. It's only the start. As that start begins to take place, you're going to find yourself walking this week and weeks ahead. I don't know how long it's going to be. For me, it was a 10-year process. But I knew the day when it was going to be. On the count of three, I want us to make a three. I mean, like thunder in here. One, Two, three.
All right. Hallelujah.